<laughs> so yeah, the, it's just part of it. Okay, so this is this is uh, based on uh, collaborations with uh, uh, some students at uh, UT Austin, Anna Gal, uh, who's here, uh, in Suriname, uh, and uh, Mahesh, who's uh, my former student now at Google. Okay, this is part two. Now, part one involved this problem that we call regenerating codes. Uh, and uh, part two has three subparts. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about locality, which is the concept that, that was introduced before, and two extensions of the concept of locality that, that we call availability, and then another related thing that's called the uh, batch codes. Uh, OK, so repair problem, as we have discussed, is you have uh, a code. Uh, you lose one symbol. You want to recreate it. And you have this newcomer node that connects to the existing nodes. The repair is recreating a single array symbol at a new location, as we have, as we have said. And the most important thing to take is, you know, the repair problem is a new important problem. That was a, the highest level bit that we are reala realizing now. Uh, and in the previous tutorial, we focused on repair bandwidth, which is how much communication do you need to reconstruct one array symbol. Uh, now, an interesting thing that is not that well known is that in regenerating codes, the way the, way the model is set up, uh, this newcomer has to be able to reconstruct by connecting to any D of the surviving nodes. Uh, so a relaxation of that is, OK, you lose something. You don't have to reconstruct by connecting to any D. Maybe just there is one set of D nodes that you, that you talk to and you reconstruct. So if you, if you, uh, if you change the game in this way, you're, you have a much easier problem. You have much more flexibility. And this, this flexibility has not been fully understood in terms of how much it benefits you in repair communication. Uh, it definitely will help you in the second metric that it will allow you to make D smaller than K. Because if you were trying to, if you were sticking with the regenerating code framework and you said, I want this node to talk to fewer than K nodes, uh, then you, you can quickly show that that's impossible to, to recover by connecting to any D. But if you fix the sets, as we will see in a second, you can do that. Uh, so we're going to relax this concept now, and we're going to focus on, uh, OK. And now the set of nodes that the newcomer talks to, it will be called a repair group. OK, now let's go back to basics for a second, minimum distance, OK? So the distance of the code, the way I, I think about it, one way is the minimum number of failures after which you lose data, OK? So that's one way of thinking about uh, minimum distance. Uh, the classic singleton bound that everybody knows is that this is the best you can hope for uh, in terms of distance for an NK code. And of course, uh, Reed solomon codes achieve the, the singleton bound, and they're called maximum distance separable because of that. Now, what is, now I'm going to define the new concept. Uh, I guess it's the same one that, that we should define. It's called locality. So locality, so a symbol has locality r if it ca it's a function of r other symbols. <clears throat> so we'll call this other r other symbols that you can read and recreate that thing a repair group for that symbol. Okay. Now, if we talk about systematic codes, uh, we can say that all the message symbols or the systematic symbols have locality R. That's a reasonable thing to ask for. And if you are more strict, you can further ask that the parities have locality R. Okay? So all symbol locality means that both the systematic symbols and the parities have small locality, which means have small groups. Uh, yeah? Is it the same if code is linear? It's not the same. So let me sh I'll show you an example right now. So let's see. So you have 10 systematic symbols, and you add four Reed solomon parties. This is, this, in particular, exactly this structure is the code that was used in uh, the Facebook Analytics cluster, uh, uh, 10 plus 4 Reed solomon OK? So this thing is a linear equation of all these 10 symbols, and it's a dense linear equation. You can easily show that if, if this is going to be an MDS code, each of those linear equations must involve all the systematic symbols. Okay, so it's a dense linear equation that involves all ten. So you start with a Reed Solomon, but this doesn't have any locality now because if you lose one thing, let's say you lose this, you have to read ten. In fact, you can read any ten, but that's trivial locality, locality k. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first five, XOR them maybe together, or make a linear combination, and create what we call a local parity. That's just the XOR of those. And now you can obviously see that if I lose any one thing here, I can read the other things and the XOR and reconstruct. Okay? So that's an extremely simple way of understanding what a local repair group is. There's a more complicated way to, to enforce these local constraints 
through algebra, and that's that's what, for example, Tam and Bark, uh, Tamo and Bark do. But I think of it this way: just exploring things is the easiest, I think. So uh, of course, it, you lose some you lose some things in in the field size, but that's okay. So we XOR these things. Now we XOR these things, and we get locality for these. But now, if I lose a parity, I don't have locality, right? I still have to read 10. But maybe, maybe you could choose these coefficients so that, let's say, for example, that this parity was the, simply the XOR of all 10, OK? If it was the XOR of all 10, then if I lose this, even though it doesn't look like it has locality, it does. Do, do you see that? Alex, why can't you just XOR this 4? XO, XOR what? This 4. These two? So if I, oh yeah, I can, exactly, and I will, yes, very good. So one thing I can do, and I will do it in a second, is add another local parity on the parities and get locality on the parities. The penalty I pay is that my, my rate went down a little bit, right, because I added a new symbol that I have to store. Just like before, very good. But, but the interesting thing I'm telling you now that's a, uh, that's a, a little different is I can get locality in the parity sometimes that is not obvious if I mess with the algebra, right? Because imagine that this was just the XOR of all 10, and that this is the XOR of the first five, and this is the XOR of the other five. Now, I, I have locality for this, but it's not obvious, because if I lose it, I can read this and this, right? So sometimes I can get locality in a non-obvious way if I mess with the algebra. But now, my equations are not in what's called in general position. So I will lose in fault tolerance if I do that. So the, the tension that we're trying to understand is how do we, how do we get the best trade-off in fault tolerance versus uh, uh, locality. Okay. So in this case, of course, all the message symbols can be recovered by reading five other symbols. And a single parity requires still 10 reads unless there's some non-trivial linear dependency that I haven't encoded in this, in this picture. Okay. Now, the question you can ask is, what's the best distance possible for a code of locality R? Which means, what, is the, the, the sets, what are the sets of failures that you can definitely recover? OK. So, okay, so, let's, so let's, let's start. So I'm going to do this thing that I enjoy very much. I'm going to write on the slide. So let's say I lose this and this. Yeah, I hear. I hear there's, a, there's something linked to my salary directly for that. So, <laughs> so can I tolerate four failures? Okay, can I tolerate any four failures? Can you, how, first of all, if I lose these local things, no problem. I can reconstruct them from, from the source. Okay. So if I lose these four, six, seven, eight, nine, can I reconstruct them? <clears throat> Why? So I, I have the global parities, right? The global parities are, are wild cards, right? They're linear equations, so they can replace any four. OK. So another, another observation here. OK, so I've never, I didn't use the local parities at all. I have enough power just from the global. OK, so these are easy situations. So now a situation that perhaps is not, OK, now how do we make this go? Oh, we do it like that. OK. So now what if I delete this? I delete this, and I delete all the parities here. Can I recover from this set of failures? So I have the local parity that is helping me to recover this, and, uh, and now I have all the data, and now I have all the, OK. Now the thing, I guess, the, the smallest case where it gets interesting is this. Can I reconstruct, can I recover from this set of failures? <coughs> no. Huh? So what's the, OK, so let's, let's think a little bit. What's the best distance you could ever hope to have? OK, so the best distance, if these were global equations, right? That's the best thing that could happen, theoretically. Well, then I have four, and I, have two, I could have two more global equations. So I could, I could hope to get any six, right? So that, but, but that would be MDS. But I'm, as I'm going to show, it's, it's not possible to get MDS. That, that's, that's, that's the main result. That, yeah. But, but you see, you could be doing some things where this, this thing, uh, and this thing combined could produce another global parity. It could be a Ritz Solomon parity that you created, where you took the coefficients of that Ritz Solomon parity and you, you do what is called splitting, which means what, what we had before, you remember there was one, 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 one. We took the first five ones, put them here, the second five ones, put them here. So when you add them, you create a, a, a global parity. This is the idea, I guess, that starts from the Pyramid Codes paper, where you create the local things so that when they are added, they give you a global thing again. 
So that is sort of the, one of the explicit ideas we have. Another one is just make random combinations. But in this case, you cannot, you cannot tolerate these kinds of failures. So that's a question that, that, that people were investigating, starting with, with uh, the Gopalan et al. paper. So um, okay, let's, let's do a warm up. In an MDS code, all symbols have a locality k. That's, uh, let me see, I'll do it one time here. Uh, all symbols have, what, what time? I started 5, late, 10, late? Yeah, so you started at about 10 past, so we can end about 12. OK, we, you, have, uh, you have equipment to stop me. Although yeah. you are hitting lunchtime, so. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So. Your, uh, yeah, yeah, OK. So let's, let's start with two easy pieces. First one, uh, in an MDS code, all the symbols have locality at most k. OK, so that's trivial because in MDS code, k symbols give you everything. So of course, if you read any k, in fact, you can reconstruct any one. OK, it's a trivial statement. OK. Uh, now this is um, also very simple. In an MDS code, uh, must have trivial locality for every symbol. So I claim that if you have any, any smaller locality, you lost MDS. OK, how do I prove that? Well. Uh, is the statement clear, first of all? OK. Now, how do I prove that? Well, if I have some non-trivial locality, so let's say I have a group that involves two systematic symbols and a parity, in the linear code, it's the easiest. This is a generator matrix. And I told you that when you add these two columns, you get this column, right? So this is a non-trivial linear dependency. Now, an MDS code means that any k by k submatrix must be full rank. But if you choose this, these three together, you have already lost rank. So you have you got already uh, non-MDS, and the proof. Uh, so the okay. So any non-trivial locality creates a linear dependency, and this creates loss of rank. Uh, okay. So the main result is that codes with all symbol locality can have distance at most this much. So this is the result by Gopalan et al. that that uh, has gotten a lot of attention recently. It looks like singleton bound, but but it generalizes singleton bound, right? So it was shown initially for scalar linear codes. And uh, we were able to basically repeat the same proof they had, but instead of rank, do it with entropy. So we were able to show that this is true even if you vectorize the code, so you deal with sub-packets. And furthermore, even if you did nonlinear things with, with the bits. So, and, and the argument, by the way, this proof, at least the, so Varixia talks about three proofs, I guess. The, the one that, I, the, way, the way that I think about it is, you have an adversary that is trying to collect as many columns as possible from this matrix, or as many symbols as possible, but on the other hand, he's trying to keep his entropy low. Uh, so the moment, so he's greedily choosing, so he's going to choose one column and choose another column. And now he can get this column for free, because it's a linear dependency. So he puts columns in the bag in this greedy way. And the question is, how many columns can he put until he must have rank R, uh, K? And that's exactly how you get this. So, and then in, in our proof, you replace rank with entropy. And it's the same argument, basically. <coughs> so this is how this is proven. Uh, and of course, if you set trivial locality R equals K, you recover the singleton bound. And you also get this interesting message that if you want any non-trivial locality in your code, you will have to pay. You, you will lose in fault tolerance of the code in, in exactly this way. Uh, and uh, initially, the, the question, of course, is, OK, can we achieve this? Right? Are there codes that match this uh, bound, have this distance? And um, pyramid codes uh, achieve actually this bound for message locality. And the idea was start with a big read Solomon and split the parities. So you split them so that they have the localities you want. But this doesn't work for all symbols. So if you want also to repair the parities. And in general, there was a lot of work trying to construct explicit codes for this. Uh, I think the, the state of the art is, uh, is the Tamwin Barg result, which does it with polynomial field size, linear field size. OK, all symbol localities. So how do we get all symbol locality? We need to add exactly what, what you said. So, so uh, we add uh, parity on the parities, like this. And the power we have here, of course, is we choose these coefficients that are forming these linear equations. And depending on how we choose them, that's, that's sort of the non-trivial part of this. The, the combinatorial structure of, of LRCs is, and you can prove that, it's kind of trivial. You partition the things, and you, you just make one, one protection. Uh, XOR for each, or one protection linear equation for each, and that's the best you can do. OK, so the coefficients in the, in the local groups must be in what's called in general position. 
So general position means that there are some linear dependencies that you cannot avoid just by the structure of, of this picture. Any other linear dependency must not be there, right? So the question is, we don't have a general tool to create linear equations in general position, except, to the best of my understanding, except making a, a, a very big field and choosing everything randomly, saying, OK, I need all these determinants to be non-zero, multiply them together. I need this big determinant to be non-zero, and do schwarz zippel on, on that. But that requires an exponential field size. We don't have a, a, deterministic, uh, a deterministic or polynomial field size way of doing that, solving a general position linear equation. But, but uh, the Tam and Balk paper does achieve this in a very nice way uh, by, I guess, generalizing with Solomon. Uh, but it doesn't, do, it doesn't tolerate all the patterns that are correctable. The, the problem, yes, please. Uh, so, so you're saying that if, for example, like you said earlier, P1 is x1, x0, or x2, yeah. um, it, it's good in the sense that um, it's easy to reconstruct if you lose some of those, but it's actually bad because you have worse false fault tolerance? Yes. Okay, so you want to avoid that? It depends. It depends if you want, if it depends, right? So sometimes you want locality for, the, if you want locality for the parities, you have to pay for it either by creating a parity on the parities or by making this the XOR of these two. But then you will, why do you lose in fault tolerance? I don't know if that's obvious to you, but one way that you can immediately see it is I could, you can imagine that these two together, if both of them survive the failure pattern, I could XOR them and get another parity that was P5, right? So they could, you can always think of these as potentially giving me another global parity that could be useful in some patterns, right? So that's why there's a tension between creating linear dependencies that will give you locality and linear independencies that will give you fault tolerance, right? So that's, that's what this is about. Okay, good? OK. So uh, very good. So the Tamman Bar construction does it with polynomial field size, but it doesn't tolerate all the failure patterns that are potentially correctable. And, and this was a very interesting open problem that, that Parish talked about. That's called maximally recoverable codes. We don't have a way of, of, of creating these things, basically creating linear equations in general position. What? Yeah, of course. Okay, so we can definitely do it with with a Schwarz zippel argument, but with with polynomial field size, yeah, or explicitly, in fact. Yeah. And explicitly, a lot for LRCs, a lot of constructions like the Silberstein your construction. Right, right. right. They do have a mar, but but uh, for LRCs, you can get right, right, right. Yeah, I, the polynomial field size is yeah, very good. Okay, so there is. Uh, yes, I guess I, I mentioned some uh, recent work here. Another natural thing you can do is you can put uh, uh, the you can make the local codes a little stronger, right? So you can say, oh, I want any two failures in this group to be able to tolerate them with locality. So you can add a second, you can make a little read Solomon on these five symbols, add a, a second local parity here, and that's, that's uh, related to these works here, that uh, you can get local pairs for multiple failures within a group. And the explicit LRC constructions we talked about. And another interesting piece of recent work is, OK, how do I get a locality bound, essentially this equation? What happens to this equation if I limit the field size, right? So this has been an interesting recent work uh, uh, by Mazumdar and Kandambe on obtaining distance bounds if you've, for a fixed uh, field. OK, so next part, unless there are questions. Are there questions here? OK, cool. Uh, next part is, uh, this is a fun video, observe, uh, you got all of them. So uh, multiple reads with uh, one code. So that's a concept we call availability. So we said locality means a symbol is a function of r other symbols. Availability, t, is the following thing. I, I want to not just be able to read one thing by reading a few other things, I want to be able to read it by reading it by reading a few other things many times in parallel. Okay? So I want many disjoint repair groups for, for one symbol. Uh, so that's uh, the concept of availability. Uh, and uh, these t reads have locality r if each one involves up to r symbols, of course. So these are small repair groups. Example, 
So I have this code. This is my systematic symbols, my read Solomon global parities. I, I keep this local XOR and I add another XOR where I XOR 1 and 6 and I get this and I XOR, uh, what do I do? Uh, okay, that's fine. So this is just a little code. So I have the boss and the boss wants to read block 1, so he goes and does the systematic read. But now that he does the systematic read, this, this symbol is busy, right? The, or this, the server that is storing this, this packet is busy. And now you have Wally. So Wally also wants to read symbol 1, but he can't read it systematically because the server is busy serving another job. So he can read it in parallel by reading, by using this repair group, right? 2, 3, 4, 5, and x1. And he reads those and XORs them together and he gets a parallel read. And now all these servers are busy. And now you have Dogbert, and Dogbert also wants to read symbol 1, and he can read it in parallel using the other repair group, 6 and x2, XOR them together, right? So that's why this is a useful thing when you have, and you often have data that is called hot data, where you have multiple jobs concurrently trying to read it, you want disjoint repair groups that are spread across your servers, so you can support multiple concurrent jobs. Okay. So block one can be read by one systematic plus two repair reads uh, simultaneously. So we say block one has availability two with groups of locality five because this group, this group has locality five and the second group has locality two. And notice that there are other groups, right? So there's, for example, another group you could use. Since you have this global uh, linear equation, you could read two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, and P1 and reconstruct. But that would be a terrible idea because you would be blocking all the other groups, right? So now the combinatorics become interesting because you, you have to design these groups so that they're not blocking each other too much. And also it's not trivial even after you have designed the code, after you get a, a, a something you want to read, which groups to select so that they're not blocked together. Okay. So, uh, so uh, RT information local code has T disjoint repair groups for its symbol. And you can also limit if you want the size of the repair groups to be R. In fact, you don't, sometimes you don't even have to do that because if you want many parallel groups, they have to be small just so they can be disjoint, right? Okay. So what do you use to call RT availability? RT availability, is, this is different from RT information local code. Yeah, so, so information local means, okay, so this is, this is Ankit's uh, yeah, buzzwords that I may, may be using here. So okay, so the, the so the first one is T disjoint repair groups, and also I want each one to have locality R. Now this is only for the systematic. For the parities, you can ask for just locality. So that's what Ankit was calling. Uh, yeah, I think he calls it RT availability. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter how you call it, just to make sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, it's, it's, I, I always say it with, I will describe what it means because I'm also confused with, yeah. Okay, so basically, you know, we, for every symbol you can have it's how many groups and how big are the groups, right? So we understand. Okay. Now, for example, free replication, it gives you every symbol you can read it in parallel three times, obviously. And uh, the distance of the code is bad, it's, uh, and the rate of the code, that's the most important thing, is terrible, because as you want to increase the availability, your rate goes to zero, right? like one over the, the number of times you repeat the data. So the, the locality of these reads is great, because of course, the local repair groups for one have the best locality possible, one, they're just copies of the block. So the locality is great, but the rate is terrible. So the main question that, that we were interested in is, is it possible to keep the rate constant so, so that it doesn't vanish to zero, but have scaling number of, of parallel reads, right? Uh, so that, that was the main question that we were thinking about. Uh, scaling availability with non-vanishing rate. Okay. Why is the availability two instead of three? Because for some reason we decided not to include the systematic read in the count, which every time I read my papers again, I'm tempted to define it the other way. But then the other benefit is the availability is the number of repair groups also. So the systematic read doesn't count as a repair group. So yeah, it's because of that. Okay. So uh, now the question, the first question that we are asking is, what if you want some uh, locality R and some availability T, what's the best distance you can get, right? So generalizing the, the Gobala et al. bound if you force many groups. The short answer is uh, we have a bound. 
but it has a star, and the star is quite a big star because it has a lot of dirty details under which we can prove this, this bound. So the first one, which is not a big deal, I think, is that this bound for the best distance for a given code with uh, availability R and, uh, sorry, with locality R and availability T, only holds in this, in this case, we only prove it for scalar linear codes. I don't think this is a very big deal. It probably holds for nonlinear too. M more importantly, w I'm sorry? This? This is a ceiling. Scalar linear code. I know what linear Ah, code. sorry. OK, so, so what is scalar means? Uh, OK, what is the question? What's non-scalar? So all the codes I had, <laughs> all, the co all the classical codes you ever see are, are scalar. Uh, what I did before in my previous lecture was I took a symbol and I, I sliced it up into half symbols and I was doing linear algebra in half symbols. So you can vectorize symbols and do send half symbols and stuff like that. And as you, uh, this is extremely useful in all the storage coding uh, work. So it's very reasonable to ask, before you ask for nonlinear code, say, okay, maybe there's a way to represent with subpackets. So you have a linear code over subpacketization. So that's, that's what non-scalar means, okay? Uh, now, but, so this, this result, we cannot prove it currently for non-scalar. I believe it is true. But what is more important is we make this assumption. We assume that only one parity, uh, so every repair group can in involve only one parity symbol. So that's a very restrictive structure. And you may be able to do better if you, uh, if you allow more complicated parity structure. Uh, and, and we don't know if what, what happens if you also want to have uh, uh, availability for the parities. So if you want all symbol availability. In some cases, we can achieve this bound using uh, objects called combinatorial designs. Uh, furthermore, specifically, resolvable combinatorial designs. And there's a concurrent work by Tamo and Barg that gives a different bound for minimum distance for a code with locality uh, R and availability uh, T which, to the best of my understanding, is incomparable to our bound. Sometimes our bound is tighter, and sometimes this, this bound, their bound is tighter. So this is uh, quite a wide open space to, to generalize the Gopala et al. bound if we also force many repair groups. OK, is, is it clear? Okay. Uh, a very, I just want to very quickly say a few things about how we create codes with availability. So combinatorial designs, I, I, don't, I don't want to get too much into this, but just a, I'll just say a fun, fun fact. So it's a way to, to, group, to group symbols into groups so that the sizes of the groups are fixed. And uh, every symbol appears in C subsets, so they're regular. And you have this important property that any two symbols appear in exactly one subset, or block, as they call them. This is similar to expansion. Expansion say that the neighborhoods are not overlapping too much. Combinatorial designs fix exactly how much the neighborhoods overlap, which is not needed, by the way. But this is just one way that, that we create codes here. So the other thing that is interesting is something that's called resolvable designs. Resolvable means that your, your groups, if you, if you set them, they form a full partition of your symbols. Uh, so this is uh, resolvable combinatorial designs. And a, a famous example that's kind of a fun problem is this one. Uh, you have 15 girls who will walk in groups of three each day of the week. Uh, the problem was how to place them in groups of three so that no two of them walk together uh, twice, right? So this is Monday, you know, Tuesday, and you see one and two walked together, so they're never allowed to walk together ever again. This problem has a fun story, probably more fun than the problem itself because uh, Kaylee proposed the solution, and Sylvester said that, oh, you stole my solution, all that. So there's a fun story about this in, in uh, Wikipedia. Uh, and uh, you know, right now, there's a field in combinatorics of how to design these things for a given set of parameters, which involve, of course, the size of the groups and how much uh, you know, the, the number of the groups and all these parameters. For some cases, there are explicit constructions, and we use those. Uh, the interesting thing I want to say here is this. So in those days, school was seven days of the week. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which, which would be good, I guess. about a workshop. You know, to, and, and we can apply this to a design of a workshop. Right, exactly, yeah. So it can be this, no two researchers spend, <laughs> spend more than once. <laughs> yeah, same thing. 
<laughs> exactly. Why, why was it the resolvable design? Exactly. Very good. So that's that's an interesting thing I want to say. Thank you. So what is resolvable? Resolvable says that I can partition. So the resolvable in this case means that. Uh, you know, the, every day all the girls are, are walking, right? That's what it means here. In, in the code, it means that I will take a global parity <clears throat> and I will split it, and this will be my resolvable design. So resolvability ensures that you can create the local groups by splitting global groups. So it has the extra benefit that you can do it by splitting as opposed to random linear combinations. That's why I need the resolvability, really. Otherwise, if you just make random linear combinations, you can just do it with combinatorial designs. OK. So the, using these uh, uh, designs, uh, we are able to get uh, polynomial availability. Specifically, we can support n to the 1 third concurrent reads of one symbol. And the size of each one of them is almost n to the 1 third. And this, of course, builds on specific combinatorial designs that, that we leverage to create the codes. And these are resolvable, so we can generate them explicitly using the pyramid code splitting idea. So this is the, the, the best construction we have. Uh, so, so you can say this is pretty good, right? Because you can support n to the one third parallel reads of any one symbol. It's quite, quite surprising. Uh, and the fundamental bounds is, of course, for a given locality and availability, what's the best distance possible? Our bound is tight sometimes, but most of the time it's actually really way off. So how much time do I have now? 20? Yeah, 20. 20. 20. OK, very good. OK, so this is uh, the ICIT 2014 paper and also in preparation. Ah, uh, I want to say something that I will talk about more later. Uh, and uh, many people here know more about this than I do. So there's something called smooth codes, which to the best of my understanding means that there's a linear number of groups and that they don't overlap too much, right? So which is, which is very similar to what, what I was asking before. But typically in smooth codes, as far as I understand, the number of smooth, the groups is linear, which makes this problem very, very hard. Typically, I, I was not asking for a linear but you know, the, even even uh, something like a poly would be with a small exponent would make me very happy. Uh, of course, typically I think these don't have distance, a good distance. But you can also uh, improve the distance by adding some global parities at the end if you want to. So that's not a very big deal. Now, batch codes is the other related concept that I want to talk about in the in the third part. So asking for more. So if you Google greedy. On Google Images, you get this image, which is fun image of a 3D person. So the first thing we asked was, we want one small repair group for each symbol, right? So that's called locality. Then we said, oh, you know what? I want many disjoint repair groups for each symbol. That's like availability. Now, the thing that, that we can further ask is, we can now, with availability, we can support multiple parallel reads for one symbol. but Maybe you don't just want to read one symbol a thousand times. Maybe sometimes you want to read one symbol 50, and another symbol 20, and another symbol 3, right? So maybe you want to support any set of T reads. OK, so possibly the same thing, or two things, or three things, or any number of, of symbols. So there's something called multi-set batch codes that were defined for a different uh, reason. Uh, in cryptography, I guess, or the main application is cryptography, but also a storage application that, that's a little different. But you can easily see that a multiset batch code can support a, a multiset of T parallel reads. So that means, for example, you can have T parallel reads of one symbol, which is exactly the same thing as availability. But furthermore, you could have T over two concurrent reads of any two symbols. Or, by the way, this is not concurrent, right? So it's not t of 1 and this. So it's either t of 1 or t over 2 of sum 2, or t reads concurrently of different symbols. So any such situation, any multi-set of reads, you can accommodate. Okay? This is very nice, because now when you design your storage system or your, or your scheduler, you get all this flexibility that any t things will have a concurrent leaf for you. So this is a very nice requirement. The question is, can you, can you get codes that do it? And already in the first paper on batch codes, there is a construction that, that does pretty well. Uh, so this is what you get if you Google batch codes on and Google image uh, Google images. Batch. This is probably some product, and they call these 
but like there's a secret batches of, of products. So anyway, I don't know exactly what that means. Now, batch codes um, allow a multi-set of t-parallel reads. And there's a very interesting connection uh, to smooth codes that is already recognized in the original batch code paper. So it says if you have a really good smooth code, you can massage it and create a very good multi-set batch code from that. So from the connection of these two things, and what I'm going to say here is something that I haven't seen written somewhere, so we, we're working on it. So this is current work that we're doing now with Anna and some students at UT, so I, I'm not sure if I worked this out correctly. Also, I changed notation at 4 a.m. yesterday when I was working this out. So uh, I think that this is what you get. You can support an amazing, almost linear number of parallel reads with rate approaching one, which is great, right? If you, if you combine this, this construction, which to my understanding is one of the state of the art for uh, smooth codes, with getting a batch code from a smooth code. Now, what I'm going to show you in the 15 minutes that I have left is a much, much, much easier, I think, combinatorial way of getting this. So I'm going to get n to the one third, almost. So this is worse than this because I, this is almost linear. So a little uh, significantly worse in the number of parallel reads I can do, but still polynomial. But I'm going to get a better rate. So I'm going to get the rate approaching one polynomially fast. And uh, furthermore, I can do this with a deterministic decoding algorithm while this is randomized and the, the proof is graph theoretic. And perhaps, yes? Uh, for, that, for that first one, did yes. you say that? The, uh, your availability t is linear? Almost. But no, and not only availability, it's even stronger, right? It's any, 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 any t reads. So not just t reads of one thing, but yeah. But if, if it's, uh, so is that little o of one? Yeah. Oh, but it could be like one, right? And then t is n to the one minus one or n to the zero? Or yeah, yeah, but, but this, is, this is vanishing as this little o of one is, is vanishing as, as uh, the code is growing. So, oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. So Alex, so now the locality, you are content with locality like n to the epsilon? Is that the... What's that? So the locality now, so you're not worrying about locality? I'm not, no, yes, but the locality is, is po going to be po some poly. Like n over t or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that, yeah. So of course, of course, this is enforcing locality, right? Because the groups have to be small to be discharged. Yeah. Yes, very good. So the, the, and the other thing is I can do this proof for you in 10 minutes, OK? So it's actually extremely simple, I think, almost. So let's see. The distance of these codes is bad. The distance is bad. But OK, so, so in our construction, the one we are writing now, we, ca we are making the distance uh, approach a singleton also, so we can get excellent distance. But the way we get it is little putting a little hat on top. You just add some global parities, yeah, and you can always do that as long as your rate is super good. So that's why that's why you need the rate to be super good, because then you can add a little bit of extra global parities to get the global fault tolerance. Okay, now. Uh, let's understand how all this works. So this is like if you have if you haven't understood anything, you can reboot now and start again. Ten minutes, very simple combinatorial problem. Okay, what's the combinatorial problem? I am putting k symbols, systematic symbols here, and these are just XORs for now. Okay, you're just XORing stuff. Okay, now every symbol has degree t. Okay, so he participates in t XORs, and now this XOR is the XOR of a with c. Okay. So this is a local repair group for this, of course, because you can read C and this XOR and reconstruct A, OK? All right. So I claim that if this graph has no four cycles, then each information symbol has T disjoint repair groups. That's my claim. Is this obvious? You see it? Let's see it. OK. So this is a, this is a repair group, the green repair group, OK? And this is another repair group for symbol A, the red repair group. What does it mean that they are disjoint? It means that, that this guy's children and this guy's children do not touch, right? Well, if they touch, there would be a four cycle, and that's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, very simple thing. Yes? Uh, you're not using the, the right hand. The right hand side does not have to use degree two. Uh, it's just the Okay, so, so the right hand side, the degree here is the locality of each group, right? The size of the group. So I'm, I haven't explicitly forced it, but I want their children to be disjoint so they can't have too many children, right? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So 
Uh, in all four cycles means that the groups are disjoint. That's easy. Uh, but, but uh, OK, so to maximize the availability now, what do you want? Well, you want to have a few of those, because these are parities. They make your rate go down. So you want few right nodes, but also you are forced here to have a lot of degree here. You want a lot of legs leaving each one of those vertices. So these are things that are in tension because you ha cannot have any four cycle. So this is a combinatorial question, right? How can you make a graph that has few girls, a lot of boys, and you want all the boys to know a lot of girls at the same time? People in combinatorics, of course, have looked at this extremal graph uh, construction, and we use that. Right. So that's fine. I will give some references later. But, but there's an interesting thing to give you batch codes. Batch codes means that I can also read different symbols, right? So for example, this guy and this guy have one repair group that they share. So it's not the, you cannot use this group concurrently. But that did not form any cycles, right? So, so how do you deal with, with cycles when you want to be able to accommodate any T reads, not just from one thing? OK? So the key interaction lemma that, that I have here is that if this graph, so before I was asking no four cycles. Now I'm going to ask girth eight, which means no four cycles and no six cycles, right? So I'm going to say if this graph has girth eight, and how am I doing on time? I have 10? Yeah. 10? 10? Good. OK, people are almost awake still, so good. So if this graph has girth eight and left degree at least t, then the following things happen. The first thing is that any systematic symbol has t disjoint repair groups. Why is this true? Well, this is the same as before, right? So get fate means no four cycle already, OK? Now, further, for any pair of, of systematic symbols, uh, if, if uh, any one of their disjoint groups of xi has common symbols with at most one of their repair groups of xj, which means you can block at most one every time. So that's, that's the, the key local argument. Why is this true? Well, you just do a few cases, and you see that if this is not true, you will get a six cycle or a four cycle. So the, the proof is like one page, very simple proof, actually. You just say, OK, if they overlap this way, there's a four cycle. Otherwise, there's a six cycle. So that's, that's basically the local argument. Now, if you have this local argument, you can support any t parallel reads. Because the way you do it is you say, OK, Choose one symbol. It has its t options. Now you want to do another one. You know that it will not, not at most one will be blocked from each one of them. And you keep going in a greedy way to construct getting a bound on how many things are blocked in each step. This is a very, very simple greedy way to construct which groups to use, since you know what, how much blockage there can be. So it's a very simple proof. Is it clear? Any questions? OK. So. So basically now, we just need a way to construct graphs with, with few uh, right uh, vertices, as high degree as possible, and uh, no four cycles and no, uh, no six cycles. So this is some of the works that, that we leverage in, in the paper that we're writing right now. In particular, I think this is probably the, the one that gives us the, the best construction, right? So the, the, the one that Balbuena, I think, is the one that that gives us the best asymptotics. Uh, and basically, it gives us what I claimed before, uh, n to the one third uh, a parallel a arbitrary reads with rate approaching one, polynomially fast. OK, so this is the, the end of uh, the talk, conclusion open problems. Which repair metric to optimize? Well, we said you can repair communication, or locality, or availability, or a combination. So the answer, I think, is it depends from the practical side. So if you have a cloud server or an analytic server or a photo storage server, this different, these things matter differently. So it's a complicated world. And to have a real impact, I think you have to talk to the people who really do these things. And like you, know, you can say, this is the best car, or maybe this is the best car, or maybe this is the best car. But of course, it depends you know, where you want to go. And in, the, in reality, the, the, this is what you will end up having in a, in a real system, I think. <laughs> so something combines everything in a, in, a, in a way like that. So open problems. For repair bandwidth, what is the exact repair bandwidth region, of course, is open. 
practical, exact MSR codes for high rates are open, as we discussed. Repairing with a finite field limit is open. And uh, repairing Reed Solomon, for example, is open. Uh, going back to Venkat's question yesterday, I, I thought a little bit about the asymptotics. The, the trivial construction reads k symbols, communicates k symbols to repair one. Uh, the theory says it could drop down to constant asymptotically because the regenerating codes bound gives you as, so fix the rate to any constant you want and grow n. Uh, regenerating codes give you, uh, so it will look like this. So, so the trivial thing is k, so it doesn't change. As you increase k and you fix, the, so this is the MSR point, can't write. Uh, okay. And the thing that we have is basically just a constant away from this. So, so this is constant and this is approaching uh, constant here. So there's a ridiculous embarrassing gap for its Solomon. And I don't know where the truth lies. Okay? Oh, it won't go. <laughs> okay, so I, if I do this, maybe it will go. Okay, good. Now it's gone. Uh, locality. So what is explicit LRCs with um, MR, the problem that, that Perkshit also said? This is very interesting. Ah, this is also a very interesting question. So subpacketization, as we said, means splitting into subpackets and doing network coding locally before communicating. We saw that this helps in regenerating codes. Does it help in codes with locality? Or does it help, for example, you can ask even in the LDC context, uh, does it reduce communication to do some local combinations of sub-symbols and send sub-symbols uh, when, you, when you're asking for an LDC or for a, for a locally repairable code? So I don't, have a, I don't have an example where it helps. And it could help in communication, right? So that's an interesting question. Even an example for this, please send me if you find one. For availability, what's the trade-off for distance, of course, is open, and practical codes are open. Another open problem that I have is the girth argument that I just presented gives you batch codes, and smooth codes give you batch codes, but I don't know how batch codes can give you smooth codes. Maybe there is a simple argument, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, my big high-level open question here is, can you use simple Gerth arguments like the ones I said to obtain LDCs or uh, smooth codes? Uh, and then you can just do graph theory <laughs> instead. So I don't know. And uh, of course, in terms of applicability, I think that all these questions are applicable to hot data, which means uh, data that's frequently accessed. And there's actually a recent paper on, uh, uh, by Facebook that uses some sort of an LRC construction for their photo storage uh, cluster. So there's, there's a lot of practical questions that you can ask and um, uh, implement these systems in real storage. So I will stop here. Wow. You finished before uh, noon? Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. All right, any more questions for well, Alex? Yeah. Just one comment about the, the girth arguments producing smooth things. Uh, so much like the original uh, distance things, I think uh, expanders are known to give some kind of smooth forms. Yeah. Right. It's in the same regime as this uh, KSY. So I, I'm not fully understanding uh, how expansion and girth. Uh, so girth, uh, girth is an easier thing to, uh, than expansion, right? So. So yeah. So you yeah, assume expanders. It's more gives you more power. So using that, there is a paper which gets uh, LDCs. I see. Same regime as this case. And that just uses combinator. Just the combinator. The combinator thing is some sort of Tanner-like construction. Locally, you use some smooth codes, which you have to find by some mechanism. And then you just use them as checks in, in a big expander. I see. I see. But I guess the benefit of girth over expansion, and this this we used in LDPCs also, is. Girth you can check in poly time, and right, so that, that, that would be very nice if you can get with Girth. But I see, so. Okay, you have no more questions. Thanks so much, Alex, for coming here. Thank you.